Good morning and welcome to Grand Rapids First United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us for our virtual worship today. We pray that as we continue to be in worship together in this format, God will continue to work with us and through us to find ways to share God's message of hope, peace, love, and grace. Here are a few words from life in our community today. Tonight at 5.30 in the north parking lot of the church, youth and families are invited to join us for an evening with J.D. Chapman from Realism is Loyalty to talk about gun violence in Grand Rapids. Please wear a mask and bring a lawn chair and come early for a temperature check and sign in. First, the First Church Sanctuary will be open for personal prayer on Mondays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Our homemade mask supply at the church is growing low. If you enjoy sewing masks, we would love for you to make a few and drop them off to the church office anytime between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., Monday through Thursday. Our staff and visitors greatly appreciate them. In collaboration with Feeding America, the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan will be providing food for our communities. The next volunteer date is October the 27th, from 3.30 until 6 p.m. Visit grfumc.org backslash news for the sign-up link. We are collecting school supplies for our tutoring lab at Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Academy. Please drop off the supplies on Wednesday, October 28th from 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. to the First Church North parking lot. A shopping list can be found at our, on our website grfumc.org backslash news. Do you have your Halloween costume ready? Our friends at Clark Retirement Community would love to see you at the costume parade on Saturday, October the 31st. Costume parades will take place at both campuses, at Franklin on Franklin Street and at Keller Lake, and we'll step off at 2 p.m. Please contact Audrey Cavill with details or to volunteer as a parade steward. And be sure to take advantage of this opportunity to spread some much needed cheer to our friends and family members at Clark Retirement Community. We invite you to be in prayerful communion with the following individuals. For Paul, for Pat Kathleen, for Peggy, for Connie, for Gary, for Gloria, for Ruth, and for Sherry. Thank you for joining us in worship today.
please join us in our call to worship. In the beginning, God brought cosmos out of chaos and spoke humanity into being with the words, let there be. Oh God, give us power to speak words that bring the possibilities of a new creation into existence. After God spoke the universe and humanity into existence, God spoke again and said, it is good. Oh God, give us power to speak words that celebrate and affirm the wondrous diversity of all you have made. In the fullness of time through Christ, God spoke a messenger of love and justice for all. Oh God, give us power to speak words that liberate and heal. May our words of hope become actions of justice and peace. Amen. As we continue in worship, let us join our hearts together in the opening prayer, and let us pray. Creator God, you call us to join with you in boldly and courageously speaking words of liberating hope into our world. Yet we confess that we are often silent, and that our silence in the face of injustice is sin. Forgive us and give us the power and courage to speak words that will challenge systems of inequity. May we be willing to speak until the strongholds of racial prejudice and bigotry crumble before the new creations of justice and equality for all people. Teach us, heal us, and empower us in our time of worship through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first lesson today comes from Psalm 33. Hear now the word of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteousness. Praise benefits the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Haley and Ian, what name have you given your daughter? Nettie Elizabeth Charnley. Elizabeth Charnley. Haley and Ian, I ask you these questions. Do you, do you reject all, all that inhibits human flourishing and accept the freedom and power gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, would you answer, I will? I will. No. You desire to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, put your whole trust in his grace, and genuinely strive to follow the new way of life that Christ taught. I will. I will. And will you nurture your daughter in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, would you answer, I will? I will. I will. And to all who are gathered here to family, will you nurture Nettie in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life. We will. We will. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. I ask you these three questions. Do you believe in God? I believe, I believe in God, God, creator of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Maria, can we do this together? Maria and I are going to do the Lord's Prayer. We invite you to join us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we are going to pour the water 
it's going to pour the water into this beautiful bowl and then have a blessing to have all of you involved in this. And this is a bowl that's got some Swedish heritage to it. Thank you. Part of the ancestry we celebrate in our family. I'd like you all to raise a hand in blessing. Bless, O oh Lord, this water. Water that's made from the elements that you have created. Water that reminds us, reminds us of how you moved over the water in creation and you brought order out of chaos. And we pray that certainly now in our world. We remember also the water where Moses as a baby was placed on the water by his mother Jochebed in trust that he'd be delivered and drawn up from the water and help save his people. And we also remember how Jesus came to the water and was baptized. And God said when he saw the baptism of Jesus, you are my beloved child. I am pleased with you. And so we know today God looks down and is with us and sees us all, especially little Nettie, and says, you are my beloved. And so we ask your blessing, O oh Lord, on this precious water, the source of our being, and help us to care for the water in all the ways we care for creation, who with Kaylee and all the others to keep water clean and pure and doing the good work it was created to do. And all God's people said? Amen. 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 Oh my. <laughs> Goodness, my goodness, you have indeed grown since I held you in your hands. <laughs> Maddie, Elizabeth, Charnley, that name from the traditions of your family. And for your faith, we baptize you. You can place your hand with you. We baptize you in the name of the Creator. <laughs> and the Redeemer. And the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. The Holy Spirit work within you, Nettie Elizabeth that you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ all your days. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And amen. So, Daddy, we welcome you into the family of faith through your baptism. If God has already been working in you, we know God will continue to work in you. As God continues to work in all of us as we surround you and welcome you and also um, invite you to teach us more about God's love as, as we share in that love with you. Amen. Amen. Hi, my name is Susan Rao and I would like you to join me in the congregational response. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and we welcome you in Christian love. As baptized members of Christ Holy Church, we are in a covenant relationship with you in growing to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We renew our vows faithfully to participate with you and with each other through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in all things God may be glorified through us as we become instruments of grace and peace in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.
can you guess where we are today? We are at Clark Retirement Home at Keller Lake to tell you about something super fun that we have planned for Halloween. What? On Halloween, you and your family are invited to come here or to go to the Clark at Franklin campus for a costume parade. <gasps> what? Do you have your Halloween costume ready? Ooh, friends, I have to tell you, we have set this up and there are people who live here who are so excited to see you. And setting this up has reminded me of the book that I read for our read aloud this past week. And if you didn't get a chance to see it, I'll link it in the comments so that you can see it or you can find it on our website. But the book is called Scarecrow's Hat. And it's all about a chicken who sees that her friend Scarecrow has this really nice hat. And it turns out she's kind of looking for a place to make a nest. So Hen goes around and gets things for her friends so that she can have Scarecrow's hat at the end. And at the end of my read aloud video, I mentioned, boy, I wonder why she was able to do things for other people, but also do something for herself. I wonder if that's all right. And I think it's just like this parade. You can have fun at this parade and you can get a little treat bag at the end and you can have a bunch of fun doing this, but you're also, when you come to this parade, you are also doing things for other people. It's an opportunity to give back to people who don't get to see kids a whole lot. So I hope that you will come on down and join us for the parade. Well, friends, let's say a little prayer together, okay? Can we say a little prayer? Let's say a prayer. God, thank you for the opportunity to be in service to others and to have some fun doing it. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. I hope to see you at 11 o'clock for children and worship over Zoom. And otherwise, I'll see you soon, friends. All right, goodbye. Good morning. Our gospel reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And a quote from the Reverend Steve Garnis Holmes. Don't listen for God if you're not ready to speak, to speak for truth and justice, for love and mercy. With God, to hear is to speak. Let us pray. Gracious God, Thank you for inviting us to be in community with you and with one another this morning. Please open our hearts and minds to your word so that we may be transformed into the people you have called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last Sunday, October 11th, was National Coming Out Day, a day of awareness, empathy, pride, in celebration of all that it means for LGBTQ folks to speak the truth of who we are and who we love. Even as we live in a world where it is in many and varied ways not yet fully safe to do so. Coming out is a process and I came out for the first time at the age of 18 during my first semester of college in New York. 
When I returned home to Michigan for Thanksgiving break that year, my pastor, my quite conservative evangelical pastor, asked to meet with me. Although I had never heard this pastor say anything positive or negative about the LGBTQ community, I was not expecting this meeting to go very well as I nervously walked into his office. He didn't speak when I entered the room. He just sat there quietly thumbing through the very large King James Version Bible on his desk. I assumed he was searching for something in Leviticus or Romans, the typical passages of scripture used to condemn same-sex relationships. But to my surprise, he didn't choose any of those familiar passages. Instead, he turned the Bible toward me and asked me to read 1 Corinthians 11:15. If a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, what? Needless to say, I was not expecting that to be his go-to anti-gay scripture of choice. Yet, as I've returned to this memory over the years, I've grown to realize that underneath all of the ridiculous exegetical and theological and illogical issues with using that scripture to try to guide me towards some sort of heterosexuality, there was a deep and difficult truth about the history of the church reflected in the words he chose to share with me. Her hair is given her for a covering. In the face of discomfort or disagreement or controversy, throughout history the church has too often chosen to cover things up to remain neutral, to do whatever it takes to maintain the status quo, to stay silent. So it makes sense that the response to something as beautiful as finding the courage to speak the truth of who God created me to be would be in order to cover myself back up. I grew up attending North American, middle to upper class, evangelical churches where the perceived racial identity of most congregants was white. Like I said, folks never talked much about the LGBTQ community. We were actually silent about a lot of things. We talked plenty about Jesus and personal salvation and heaven and hell. But I can't recall hearing many sermons offering authentically good news to the poor, released to the captives liberation for the oppressed, on those subjects of poverty, captivity, and oppression that were so central to the message of Jesus, the white Christians I knew didn't seem to have much to say. We didn't talk about women's rights, or homophobia, or ableism, and I can't think of a single time I heard a message from the pulpit about racism. Let me say that again. I can't recall hearing any messages about racism in the North American white evangelical churches I grew up attending. As 145 fires were set to black churches around the South in the 1990s, white Christians were largely silent. As the impacts of criminalization of people of color were beginning to come to light, and as we watched the riots in Miami and Los Angeles, we were silent. And make no mistake, while we may have been saying nothing, our message of apathy, neglect, and disregard was, and in many cases remains, deafening. Don't listen for God if you're not ready to speak, to speak for truth and justice, for love and mercy. With God to hear is to speak. In the story we read this morning in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, we encountered some deafening silence, don't we? The religious and political authorities who were watching Jesus in this story weren't saying many words, at least not out loud. They were silently standing by waiting to see whether or not Jesus' actions would align with their understanding 
of the rules for proper Sabbath observance. Would Jesus engage in work? Would he stay faithful to God on the Sabbath? Echoing what Pastor Bob spoke about last week with the lawyer who tested Jesus in the story of the Good Samaritan, the Pharisees in this story were similarly out to test Jesus because they'd been noticing that his mission seemed to regularly disrupt their deeply held religious and social convictions. And they were not terribly interested in disrupting the systems that had afforded them power and privilege. The specific issue in this story was that Jesus seemed poised to heal someone. In their minds, healing constituted work, which you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. So they were watching to see what he would do, waiting to see if they could catch him breaking a rule. And in the same way that Jesus engaged the lawyer, he also turned things around in this story and asked the Pharisees a question that challenged their legal assumptions. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill? His question was referring to the situation of the unnamed man in the story. All we know about him is that he had a withered hand, which in this context could refer to any number of ailments or issues. This and other disabling conditions throughout scripture were characterized less by specific physical ailment and more by the social situation that individuals with disabilities found themselves in, in the ancient world. Labeled as ritually impure, contagious, subject to disregard and marginalization, unable to access adequate means to earn a living or thrive in community. And so whenever Jesus healed an individual with an illness or disability, he was not only offering a prophetic call for the empowerment of that healed individual, but also inviting repentance and transformation within the communities that had practiced discrimination and exclusion. In other words, Jesus is always about making a way for complete transformation of wounded individuals and of the systems that have perpetuated their harm. So when Jesus asked the onlookers, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? I imagine he had hoped that they would see beneath the surface to the heart of his mission to the heart of the Sabbath law, which is to practice overtly and actively loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. I imagine he had hoped the crowd would speak out in alliance with the injured man, to agree to work together to repair whatever social barriers had been placed in his way, and to see that work as a holy fulfillment of the Sabbath. But they said nothing. As this man stood before them, they could have looked at him with uncovered eyes. They could have spoken about the necessity for healing, for justice, for their own transformation. But they were silent. As the story continues, it was an angry and heartbroken Jesus who finally interrupted their silence. Stretch out your hand. And when the man reached out his hand, he was set free from all that held him captive, from whatever was keeping him from fullness of life. The words that Jesus spoke created liberation and restoration for those who would listen, which is, by the way, the ultimate purpose of Sabbath, liberation and restoration. The Pharisees in this story reveal what happens when we choose to stand in silence, when we are unwilling to proclaim whether it is right to do good or evil, to save life or to kill. The question posed by Jesus demanded an answer, 
Is it faithful to let evil go on or to stand against it? Does your faith lead you to tolerate evil or to intervene? In these matters, there's never an option to do nothing, to stay silent. Refusal to stand against evil, refusal to give voice to injustice, refusal to speak in these instances is never a position of neutrality. It is always a choice to perpetuate harm. Just ask the injured man in this story. Ask any other person who's been marginalized or oppressed or disinherited. Actually, you don't even have to ask. You just have to listen. People of color, for instance, have been echoing Jesus' message for years and years and years. That silence in the face of injustice perpetuates harm. Bishop Desmond Tutu said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Justice Thurgood Marshall, we must dissent from indifference. We must dissent from apathy. Angela Davis, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. Bell Hooks, all our silences in the face of racist assault are acts of complicity. And Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Don't listen for God if you're not ready to speak, to speak for truth and justice, for love and mercy, with God to hear is to speak. We worship a God who is outspoken about justice and who expects the same from us. We worship Christ who reveals that God is never indifferent, never neutral, always choosing to stand on the side of the marginalized and the oppressed, always inviting everyone to join in the kingdom marked by liberation and restoration. But when we are silent, when we respond with indifference or neutrality to issues of injustice, we not only fail to join in the goodness of what God is up to in our world, we actually work against it. The best definition of privilege I heard was a few years ago listening to Reverend Julian de Chazier preach at a conference. He said, privilege is the ability to walk away. Privilege is the ability to walk away. When the struggle with racism or homophobia or sexism or ableism becomes, as it so often does, scary and confusing and painful and frustrating, those with privilege are able to exit the struggle, to take a break, to shift into neutral, to stay silent. But for those who daily live under the threats of racism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, and so many other systemic injustices, walking away is usually not an option. I find these words of Austin Channing Brown both hopeful and challenging. The march toward change has been grueling, but it is real. All it has ever taken was the transformed, the people of color confronting past and present to imagine a new future, and the handful of white people willing to release indifference and join the struggle. Privilege affords many of us the choice to remain indifferent, neutral, silent. But Jesus calls us to make a different choice a life-giving choice, to release our indifference, to notice Jesus on the side of the oppressed and the marginalized, to push beyond our privilege, to recognize that our flourishing is tied together with the flourishing of all humanity, and to join the struggle.
In what ways is God calling you to interrupt the silence? In what ways is God calling us to interrupt the silence? With God, to hear is to speak for truth and justice, for love and mercy. May it be so. Thanks be to God. As we breathe in, we listen in to not only the gospel, but how the gospel comes into practice in our own lives. As we breathe in, we also take in all that is around us and our work, our collective work that is necessary and needed in the face of injustice and oppression. Let us draw near to a God who listens, who hears, and invites us to become a collective voice 
a response of love and hope. Let us pray. O God of us all, in the beginning, when you saw chaos and darkness, you saw an opportunity to breathe light and life into the vast chaos. You saw something, and in your great imagination, you created created mountains and oceans, creatures as well as the human creature, each important in your balanced creation, each a complement and a collection of your love. You also instilled within your creation a freedom to create to be a co-creator, to explore. And in that exploration, we turned away from your goodness and your deep desire to be known and in relationship. But your love was so great that you did not turn away, but instead recalibrated into a new way of living together. And in that creativity, In your love, you sent your only son, Jesus, to come and live, to show in the face of injustice and oppression, of hatred and evil, a new way that your kingdom may be known on earth as it is in heaven. You continue to move as your spirit continues to call us by name to wake from our slumber, to clear our eyes, and to make make steps. Make steps through our voice and our actions. Make steps to repair, to confess, to repent, and to also be made new in your creation, in your creative spirit. As we continue to partner with you, Holy One, continue to work alongside of us, to challenge and to change, and also for us to become the community that you desire us to be, that we may live into the potential that you see in each and every one of us. Be with our city. Be with any who are hurting. Be with any who need repair as together we find ways to be good neighbors in your community of love, hope, of peace, and justice. Hear us as we live and as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
joining us in worship today. We hope that you've felt a sense of spiritual community with God and with one another, even as we've gathered from our homes to worship together. As you leave this space, know that God is at work in our world, making things right in love, in healing, in mercy, in grace. And God is inviting you to join in that holy holy work. So go in peace and go make peace in our world. Amen.